Hi, it's me, Dr. Muhammad Kazafi, and you are watching Dr. Muhammad Kazafi Views. Uh, good, 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 good morning. Where is the morning and good evening? Where is the evening? My today, uh, today's my uh, topic is that post-traumatic syringomyelia. Post-traumatic syringomyelia refers to the development of the cerebrospinal fluid filled cavity within the spinal cord and several months or year after a known trauma. It is distinct from the type of the syringomyelia that is often associated with congenital malformation such as the Chiari type 1 malformation where obstruction of the normal cerebrospinal fluid can result in the syringe occurring as a secondary phenomena and this activity reviews the presentation and the management of the post-traumatic syringomyelia and I want to present here and I want to explain the etiology of the post-traumatic syringomyelia simultaneously. I want to tell you about the what is the evaluation and how we evaluate the post-traumatic syringomyelia and I want to and I talk about this so as we start from the post-traumatic syringomyelia refers to the development of the cerebrospinal fluid filled cavity within the substance of the spinal cord as the name suggests this particular type of syringomyelia occurs after a previous trauma with or without clinical spinal cord injury and it is distinct from the syringomyelia occurring due to the congenital malformation where obstruction of the normal normal CSF flow and can result in a syrinx, syrinx occurring as a secondary phenomena. Other terms that are found in the literature in traumatic cases include cystic myelomalacia or spinal cord cyst as the name suggests it is a cyst or the cavity within the spinal cord and the management of the Post-traumatic syringomyelia is complicated and it can result in slow progressive and potentially devastating loss of the, the, the sensory and motor function in many cases. Most patients will have chronic pain which can affect their daily living functions and emotional health. Obstruction of the normal cerebrospinal fluid flow dynamic is felt too important in the generation of the spinal cord syrinx and this can occur due to the vertebral fracture, scar tissue, arachnoid adhesion, penetrating injury, post-traumatic kyphotic deformity and the arachnoid scarring without obvious recognized trauma. The presence of the spinal canal stenosis and the bony deformity such as the kyphosis is known to increase the likelihood of syrinx formation. Blood product may be a contributing factor. But this is no known racial or ethnic predisposition of post-traumatic syringomyelia. It is more common in male as they are involved more frequently in motor vehicle accident and extreme activity that give origin to the spinal trauma. Around 1 to 7 percent of the person with the spinal cord injury have been reported to develop clinical symptomatic syringomyelia with the advent and increased use of advanced imaging technology or the high risk or the higher presentation higher percentage of the person may be found to have a syringe. The incidence is higher in series with the longer follow-up and because Nowadays, patients survive longer with the spinal cord injury. Syrinx can develop at any time following a spinal cord injury and it can show early after an hematoma cavity resolve. The median duration of the post-injury to diagnosis is 9 to 15 years, but onset has been reported as early as one month and as late as 45 years after injury. It is more common in the thoracic than in cervical trauma and the older patient with those with the complete spinal cord injury have a higher incidence. I want to present one case here because uh, and, uh, I just want to present this case for the analogy so we can understand uh, what it can cause so um, uh, and how it present. So the humbly I want to present in front of you. Uh, you know there is a 55 year old man with the painless burn along with the his uh, outer fifth digit and extending proximally to the wrist 
which he says happened from the touching a hot stew and he has a previous diagnosis of syringomyelia. With an MRI, demonstrate a syringe cavity from the T2 to T8 on MRI three years ago. And which of the following is most likely to be found on further evaluation of this patient? So, in my disease, in my opinion, parts of the uh, sorry, ptosis of the ipsilateral eye is uh, is the thing with that, and and you know that the ptosis of the ipsilateral eye concern at this time is of the extension of his syrinx suffered into the C A T one dermatome as evidenced by loss of pain and temperature sensation and risk of thermal injury. Syrinx cavity are often centrally situated and can affect crossing spinothalamic fibers unilaterally or bilaterally and result in loss of pain and temperature sensation. Involvement in the T1 level of the spinal cord can cause a complete or partial Horner syndrome and sympathetic fiber descend in the spinal cord and exit with the T1 nerve root. Horner syndrome include the partial ptosis, eyelid dro uh, drooping, and hydrosis, decreased sweating, meiosis, constricted smaller pupil, which is meiosis definitely, and the uh, anophthalmus eyeball being inset. So, intrin intrinsic atrophy occur with the involvement of T1 innervated muscle whether from the spinal cord or peripheral cord, a claw hand with the flexion of the 4 and 5 digit would point to significant ulnar nerve injury. Ulnar neuropathy at the elbow or the cubital, or the cubital tunnel is associated with the, the tunnel sign in that location. And the median neuropathy in the carpal tunnel or the carpal canal is associated with the tunnel sign in that location. The ulnar nerve is served by CH1 nerve root and injury to the nerve could occur separately or together with the spinal cord damage at this level. So as I want to tell, I just give this case as an analogy for the post-traumatic uh, syringomyelia and but I, uh, I want to talk about little uh, the pathophysiology. You know the precise pathophysiology is not completely understood, but several theories have been proposed. All relate to the abnormality of the CSF flow dynamics and the CSF may be forced into the spinal canal due to the, or the spinal cord due to the obstruction of the flow by dural adhesion or scarring and unable to exit because of a one-way valve phenomena. During cuffing and sneezing, Changes in the CSF pressure, which are normally uh, dissipated, cannot due to the blockage of the normal CSF flow. High versus lower pulse pressure region may play a role as well, and others have a proposed uh, 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 venturi effects, whereby more rapidly CSF follow in a region of the dural stenosis pulls the spinal cord outward laterally. And you know, the histopathology syrinx cavity may take a variety of form and some person may have a single cavity but other may have a second cavity as well. And the syrinx cavity may be multiloculated with the tissue septation seen in the imaging and the pathological specimen. Syrinx cavity are not composed of a pure CSF but contain varying amount of the cellular elements and the debris. and Chronic syringe cavity may show the surrounding gliosis, so the syringe cavity have traditionally been believed to dissect under pressure through intramedullary tissue. So how the history and physical exam appear for the, uh, or you can ask or you can examine uh, for the uh, uh, post-traumatic syringomyelia. As you know, the median duration of the post-injury to the diagnosis is 9 to 15 years and pain is the most common reported symptom and present at localization to the zone of the injury or diffusely below the injury level. It is neuropathic and can be aching 
burn stabbing and may be tender to light touch or the pressure and an ascending sensory level may or may not be noticed by the patient and and patient may increase with setting up lying down cuffing or sneezing and tissue tenderness in the zone of the injury can feel identical to bruised tissue yet no bruising is evident patient may report to loss in a previously uh, present voiding reflex bowel function or uh, excretions neurological examination is critical as these can reveal increased numbness weakness change in tone or spasticity or autonomic changes hyper uh, hydrosis heartbeat and the blood pressure instability selective loss of pain and temperature with relative preservation of the dorsal column function touch and pressure are the classic finding this is known as the sensory dissociation motor weakness may occur early but it is more more often a late finding some patient may retain motor function despite very large sphincter cavity and the previously present uh, muscle stress reflex may be lost so the evaluation here the magnetic resonance imaging is the imaging of choice for initial diagnosis of the when a post traumatic syrinx and this is the lack of the correlation between the symptoms and the cavity size the cavity is usually found at the site of the spinal column fracture or the abnormal angulation computerized tomographic computerized tomographic scan myelopathy may be necessary for person who cannot undergo mri as it can delineate or obstruct the dye flow into the cord tethering dural adhesion plain radiograph include flexion extension view are used to detect spinal instability spinal kyphosis fracture and dislocation but electromyography may include the finding of various form of abnormal spontaneous activity these are the non specific and the electro diagnose diagnosis is be, is best used for the exclusion of other cause uh, producing similar symptom and the motor evoke potential can be used to demonstrate and follow prolongation of the central motor conduction time and should be used intra operatively by incomplete patient how uh, however this technology is not widely available and mri is used to follow follow a patient and evaluate the surgical treatment so magnetic resonance imaging as i mentioned uh, in the imaging of choice for the initial diagnosis of post traumatic sphingomyelia and this is the lack of correlation between the symptoms and the cavity size the cavity is usually found at the site of the spinal column fracture and abnormal angulation so the computerized tomographic scan myelography may be necessary for the person who cannot undergo mri as it can be delineate and the of an obstruction to dye flow due to the cord tethering dural addition so the plain radiograph include the flexion extension views are used to detect spinal instability spinal kyphosis fracture and dislocation and simultaneously i told you the electromyography may include find of the various form of the abnormal spontaneous activity and these are non specific and electro diagnosis is best to use for the exclusion of the other causes and producing similar symptom and it is very very important as you know syringomyelia for the treatment point of view syringomyelia is difficult to treat and the treatment of the syringe cavity is primarily surgical and if they are producing symptom and the disability some author feel that the motor loss is infrequent or late and therefore conservative management is indicated the majority advocate early surgery as a mean of the reducing progressive delayed deficit and the conservative treatment is usually associated with a potential risk of the neurological worsening is up to 68% of the patient within a year some patient can have a spontaneous regression of cyst and the shunting of the syrinx cavity syringo and a syringo peritoneal syringo pleural is often attempted initially shunt may become clogged with the debris and require placement shunt failure with cavity recurrence and the shunt related complications are very high in some series so the other uh, other drainage and a procedure such as needle aspiration myelotomy or uh, 
and uh, cord opening are less common. The more recently favored surgical approach include those made with the re-establishing normal CSF flow through the area of area of narrowing due to the dural scar adhesion and the spinal cord tethering. So these include laminectomy with the intradural exploration, lysis of the adhesion and widening of the CSF space via duroplasty. Although this is a posterior surgical approach and care should be taken to evaluate and treat anterior tethering as well and in high cervical lesions or cases with the extensive multi multi-level scar tissue the approach may not be possible and the recurrence of the syrinx uh, formation can occur with all procedures some have reported that the change in the syrinx size and does not correlate with the clinical outcome but other have found the opposite. So the promising therapy is being recently investigated in which autolo uh, autologous bone, bone marrow drive mesenchymal stroma cells are injected in the syringe of the post-traumatic syringomyelia. Serial neurological examination are critical for the following patient with the known syringomyelia and handheld uh, the dynamometry of the key muscle group can can provide a useful object to adjunct uh, to adjunct to manual muscle testing and the patient's report of changing in function such as ambulation wheelchair propulsion or transfer can be the most important factor to determine the progression of the condition and patient with the cervical syringomyelia need monitoring of the pulmonary function to assist for worsening of the vital capacity and the interdisciplinary evaluation of the rehabilitation team can assist the need for changes in mobility device seating walking activity and the activity of the daily living and the team will help to mitigate increasing risk of the complication such as pressure ulcers and decline in the mobility and fall spinal and I use the differential diagnosis for the spinal instability tether spinal cord spinal hematoma glial scar for glial scar formation with mass effect subacute progressive ascending myelopathy apoto and apoptosis of the um, spinal tissue here these are the differential diagnosis here and as I mentioned that regarding the treatment of the patient before and the prognosis, you know the conservative treatment usually lead to the progress, progressive neurological deterioration within a year in those patients who present with the deficit. So the small cyst in the asymptomatic or minimal symptomatic patient do not need the initial surgery, but for those the symptomatic patient who undergo a surgical procedure, most have good result for a radicular symptom, but less encouraging result for autonomic symptoms or if passes so the cessation of the system and the improvement occur in nearly about 90% of the patient so the surgical option is still worthwhile and we can use that and it is helping for the patient complication you know the progressive numbness progressive weakness increased spasticity hyper hydrosis blood pressure instability postural hypotension pressure ulcers decline in the mobility fall neuropathic uh, uh, arthropathic cohort joint burns to uh, uh, senseless area a progressive scoliosis loss of bowel and the bladder function sensory motor deterioration of surgery is performed emotional instability so the long list of the complication and the most common are progressive numbness progressive weakness increased spasticity hyperhidrosis, blood pressure instability, postural hypertension, pressure ulcer, decline in mobility, falls, neurological arthropathy such as the cohort joint, burns to senseless areas, progressive scoliosis, and loss of bowel and the bladder function, sensory motor deterioration of surgery, if surgery is performed and emotional instability. Consultation here required for the neurosurgical consultation is indicated when the surgery is being considered and the electrodiagnostic consultation can be helpful for the evaluation for the other concomitant radiculopathy, spinal cord injury specialist, physical and the occupational therapist to address the mobility, sitting, self-care, neuro, neurogenic bowel pain specialist needed, neuro-urology neuro specialist if neurogenic bladder is involved, 
So here, the most important thing here, you know, the most of these patients have the emotional and physical challenges due to their the initial primary spinal cord injury. As syringomyelia cause a new deficit, patients should be encouraged that it is a treatable condition and outcome are good in the majority of the patient with pain symptoms and the patient may need an aggressive rehabilitation phase to improve the motor and the spastic symptoms. And you know the collaboration, shared decision making and the communication are the key element for the good outcome and the interprofessional care provided to the patient must use an integrated care pathway combined with an evidence-based approach to planning and evaluating for all joint activity. So the interprofessional team that provide a holistic and uh, integrated approach to the post-operative care can help achieve the best possible outcome. Post-operative syringomyelia is a difficult disease to evaluate and treat. It requires a coordinating team approach of multiple specialists and the supportive care of the physical and occupational therap therapist, nurse, and the, uh, and the clinician. So I just try to explain this post-traumatic syringomyelia in front of you. I hope you will like it. If you like it, please share it, subscribe me, and support me. I need the support from you people. Thank you so much.